All right, then I see that it is now one o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and begin. Uh, once again, my name is Andrew, and I am, of course, with the Liberty Science Center, uh, working in the Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium, the biggest planetarium in America. For obvious reasons, we can't be with you in the planetarium today, so uh, I'm speaking to you from my, uh, my apartment uh, right outside of Jersey City. Um, we're going to be talking today about some things that you can look for in your sky during July um, with a focus on a couple of planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, before we do begin, though, a couple of uh, very quick things. Um, first of all, if you have questions for me during the show, uh, you can write them in the comments. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on them the best that I can. So if you see me looking away from my webcam, I'm probably checking uh, for any questions that you have. We, we also have Mike, who is uh, in the comments today, who will be typing out some answers uh, to your questions as well but I'll be hanging out after the show is done with to answer uh, even more of your questions then as well. Uh, now, um, one more final thing and then, then, and then uh, we'll begin. So uh, Liberty Science Center uh, is a nonprofit um, and as a nonprofit right now, we, we really do rely on your support um, and the, the support of our members and our, our donors to help us uh, continue to stay open and to reopen, uh, hopefully, sometime soon. So if you're able to and would like to, to support us, uh, there should be a donate button uh, over next to my head somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where, somewhere around here. Uh, you should be able to see a, a donate button where, where you can directly support us and help us continue to do uh, these Facebook Live planetarium streams, which I have uh, loved doing. So I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, again, talking about the July sky, talking about Jupiter, talking about Saturn, um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started by first looking over at the sky as it would look uh, really any day during the summer, right as the sun is about to go down. And everything we're going to be seeing today will apply for the whole month of July and also for, for pretty much all of, of August as well. So we're going to watch the sun go down beneath our horizon and that will eventually bring out our beautiful nighttime sky. Now, we're watching the sun go down right now, and the sun, every single night of the year, sets in the same rough direction in the sky. The sun always rises in the east. It then always sets in the west. So we can turn on our helpful cardinal direction marker here. This big W means that we are facing toward the west. Now, if you have ever been to a planetarium show that I have done before, um, you know what I'm about to ask you to look for in the sky. I begin every planetarium show I do in pretty much the same way. I'm gonna ask you to look for the Big Dipper. That's because it's the first thing I always look for when I go outside stargazing. So uh, take a look in the sky right now, see if you can find the Big Dipper anywhere. It's made up of seven bright stars that kind of make the shape of a, of a spoon or a, or a saucepan. So look around, see if you can find that Big Dipper uh, in the sky anywhere. It's always the first thing I look for. It's my favorite thing to find in the sky. And right now, the Big Dipper is going to be over to the right. We are looking over here in this part of the sky. So this is the Big Dipper. And the summer is a great time to find it because it's up nice and high in the sky. Now, we look for the Big Dipper for one reason in particular. We use a couple stars at the end of the bowl to point our way to another very, very important star. We're going to draw a line through the two stars at the very, very end of the bowl, follow where those stars point us up into the sky, and they are going to show us to the North Star. We'll draw that line one more time through those two stars at the end of the bowl up into the sky to the North Star. Now, the North Star is great because it always points our way toward the north. Let's go ahead and kind of spin the sky around or uh, kind of spin our bodies around, I guess, is how we can think about that. The North Star is important because it always points our way toward the north. It's a part also of a small shape in the sky that we call the Little Dipper. So the big and little dippers together are a couple things you can find during July very, very easily. 
Again, we're looking out at the sky right after sunset, about 10.30 in the evening. But the Big and Little Dippers are not constellations. We may have heard that they are before, but they're a different kind of shape that's called an asterism. But if we use a few more stars around the Big Dipper, we can form it into a constellation named Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The Little Dipper we can form into its own constellation too, a smaller bear in the sky that we call Ursa Minor. So these are the first two constellations that we can find every night of the year, but especially during the summer, they get up pretty high uh, in the sky. It's also usually warmer outside, easier to hang out and uh, go stargazing when you don't need to put on a winter coat like you would during the, during the winter time. But the northern sky doesn't change a ton during the year. You can mostly see the same things in this part of the sky. But the southern part of the sky changes all the time, right? The southern part of the sky is where we really notice things changing with the seasons. So we're going to spin around once again to that part of the sky, past the east until we are facing toward the south. Now the southern sky here, very close to the horizon, has a few things in it that I always love to look for during these warmer months of the year. The first shape I want us to look for is it kind of looks like a kind of like a sideways letter J almost. It's a shape of stars that we can make in the sky. Oh, and uh, I'm, I'm seeing a question from Sophia about what, about, uh, about what does Ursa mean? That's a great question. Uh, uh, Ursa is Latin, I believe, for bear. Major is Latin for big. So Ursa major means big bear. Great question. Now, the, the little like J shape that we see in our southern sky here, um, we can also kind of draw like, uh, like a fish hook, like this. If you've ever seen the Disney movie Moana, one of my favorite movies ever, um, in Moana, she looks for Maui's fish hook. That's these group of stars. So if you have ever wanted to see Maui's fish hook with your own eyes, you can do that during the summer. Just look directly toward the south right as the sun is going down, around 10 o'clock, 10.30 or so at night. But the fish hook, Maui's fish hook is an asterism just like the Big Dipper is. It's not technically a constellation. Though, if we add a few more stars onto it, we can form it into a shape that looks like this. Now I'm curious, what do you think this stick figure shape looks like? What kind of shape does that look like to you? If you'd like to share what you think this looks like, you can let me know in the comments. I'll take a look and see what you all think it looks like. To me, it kind of looks like a big, like a big hammerhead shark. That's what this has always looked like to me. Yeah, kind of. I'm seeing uh, Doreen mentioning this. Kind of just looks, looks, looks. There's like a big, kind of, kind of crooked J almost, like an archer maybe. Okay, a fishing rod, an arrow, an anchor, looks kind of like a big snake. And I am seeing quite a few of you mentioning that this looks like a scorpion. Well, as a constellation, this is indeed the shape of Scorpius the scorpion. Now, Scorpius the scorpion uh, in Greek mythology was a, um, uh, was kind of the adversary of another famous constellation named Orion. Orion was a hunter, and he was so good at being a hunter that he uh, was trying to hunt every single animal on the earth. The Greek god, uh, 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 some of the Greek gods didn't like that idea. They liked the idea of animals being around, so they summoned this big scorpion, Scorpius, to uh, hunt down Orion. And so we find Scorpius in the sky right now. If we look, though, toward the center of Scorpius's body, we find a very bright kind of reddish colored star. We'll put a label on it. That reddish star is named Antares. Antares is, believe it or not, one of the largest stars that we can see with our eyes. 
Just how big is Antares? Well, let's take a moment and compare it to a star that we know pretty well, the sun. So here's the sun. Now, before we bring up Antares, I want to give us another kind of sense of scale here. So put up directly next to the sun, we have our tiny little planet Earth. The Earth is very small compared to the sun. The Earth is so small that we could fit over one million Earths inside of the sun. The sun is really, really big. But Antares is even larger. If we put up Antares directly next to the sun, this is how large Antares would be. Antares is about 700 times larger than the sun. So it's what we call a red supergiant, a gigantic star, 700 times wider than our sun. Antares is so big that if we put it where the sun is, Antares would stretch out past the Earth, past Mars, almost all the way to Jupiter. So even though the sun is big compared to us and big compared to the Earth, the sun is not very large compared to a gigantic star like Antares. There are other very large stars out there too. Antares is just uh, the biggest star that we can see here for the southern part of the sky. Now, we'll come back here to the southern sky in just a moment. Um, uh, but there's also something that I love to look for during the summer uh, that we call the Summer Triangle. To find the Summer Triangle during July, you need to actually look very high up in the sky. We need to look like straight up above our heads. So we'll do just that. We'll rotate our heads up a little bit. Yes, we'll make our uh, planetarium software do that for us here until we're looking straight up. If you look straight up into the sky tonight and all during July and during August as well, you will be able to find the Summer Triangle. It is made up of these three bright stars here. These three stars of course, have names of their very own. They are named Deneb, Vega, and Altair. So these are the three bright summer triangle stars that we can find. Now, each of these stars is, of course, also a part of its very own constellation. Vega is a part of a constellation that we call Lyra the Harp. Lyra the Harp looks a little bit something like this. Altair is a part of a constellation that we call Aquila the Eagle, who looks something like this. The third and final of these summer triangle constellations is this one right here. This is uh, one of my favorite constellations in the sky. It is called Cygnus, Cygnus the Swan. And when I talk about astronomy, my favorite thing to talk about is black holes. I love black holes. When I was in college, that's what I did my research on. When I was learning astronomy, I love black holes. And Cygnus is a very special constellation because of a little object next to the neck of Cygnus that we call Cygnus X1. And Cygnus X1 is the first black hole that humans ever found. Cygnus X1 is the first black hole humans ever found. This was, this was a few decades ago. We found Cygnus X1. Finding black holes is really hard, right? They don't emit any light. They're completely dark. We can't see them on their own. We found Cygnus X1, though, because it was orbiting very close to another star. So close to the star that the black hole is slowly eating that star almost. It's, the gravity from this black hole is pulling the gas off of this star. As that gas falls in, it joins this big swirling disk, which lights up. and It allows us to see Cygnus X1. It allows us to see the black hole. Now, it's called Cygnus X1, Cygnus, because of the constellation that we find it in. X1 means that it is the brightest source of X-rays in Cygnus. So when we look 
at that part of the sky with a telescope that can see x-rays, this right here shines very, very brightly. That's how we found it. We look for these really, really bright x-rays. It allowed us to find Cygnus X1, and it has allowed us, using the same idea, to find a couple dozen other black holes that exist in the Milky Way galaxy. So, again, that is Cygnus X1. It's right kind of next to the neck of Cygnus the Swan. You won't be able to see the black hole with your eyes. You can never really see a black hole, but you need a really powerful telescope to even be able to detect that it's there. But when you find Cygnus, now you'll know that next to the neck there, we find a black hole. Now, we're going to spin our, I guess, kind of tilt ourselves back down, looking closer toward the horizon, back at that southern part of the sky. So we're going to be looking, let me zoom us back in a little bit here, uh, for the two, I want to call them stars of the show today. They're not really stars, they're planets um, that are visible in this part of the sky. So we have two planets that we can find very brightly in the sky tonight. They're over to the left of Scorpius and also over to the left of this little teapot shape here. Uh, this is one of my favorite shapes to look for in the sky. This little teapot shape to the left of Sagittarius um, is a part of a constellation uh, that is named Sagittarius, the centaur archer. So the so the uh, the teapot part of Sagittarius is uh, kind of his his arm and his bow, as we're seeing it drawn here. Directly to the left, though, of Sagittarius and to the left of that teapot is where we can find our two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So these two bright dots of light right here, you're going to find them in the same part of the sky all summer long. These two bright dots of light are Jupiter and Saturn. And let's begin with the brighter of the two, this one over on the right. So do you think the brighter of these two dots is Jupiter, or do you think it's Saturn? What do you think? Which, one, which, which planet do you think this, this dot might be? Is that Jupiter, or is that Saturn? And to answer a, a question while, uh, while I give you time to think about that, um, can black holes ever eat the Earth, or can black holes ever be dangerous to the Earth? Thankfully, black holes are so far away from us that they're never a danger to us at all. Um, I've spent the last 10 years, 20 years even, learning as much as I can about black holes, and I'm not worried about them at all. So there's no need to be worried about black holes. They're way, way too far away. All right, so I am seeing uh, uh, Ali's thinking that, it, that it's Jupiter. Uh, Therese is also saying Jupiter. I'm seeing Victoria and Alicia guessing Saturn. Hmm, let's think about this for a moment. The things that can make a planet bright, there's really two things that can make a planet bright. It can be bright because a planet's really big, or it can be bright because a planet is close to us. In Jupiter's case, Jupiter is larger than Saturn. It's also closer to us than Saturn. So this planet is indeed the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is a big gas giant. That means it's made up of nothing but gas. It's also the largest planet in the entire solar system. Just how large is Jupiter exactly? Well, if we could take Jupiter, kind of, kind of, kind of break it in half almost, and line up a bunch of models of the Earth inside of it, it would take 11 planet Earths to stretch across the inside of Jupiter. All those little circles you're seeing there are little planet Earths. It would take 11 Earths to stretch across Jupiter. That means we could fit over a thousand Earths inside of the whole big volume of Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It is, it is more massive than every other planet combined. It is incredibly massive. It's also, though, very far away from us. Jupiter is very far away. It's a, several, it's a few hundred million miles away, even at its closest. For us to travel to Jupiter would take us several years. 
to get there. So we don't send people to Jupiter, but we still study the planet Jupiter with spacecraft. One spacecraft we will be seeing here is named Juno. The Juno spacecraft made it to Jupiter in the year 2016. It's one of the main tools that we have used to study the planet. Now, there, there are no people on Juno. It's just a robot that we control and pilot from the Earth. There's no people on there. But it's the main tool that we are using now to help us better understand Jupiter. Now, my favorite part about uh, Juno is, uh, is, is the very, very wild orbit that it takes. The orbit's not quite that wild. Let's try this, uh, let's try this uh, uh, one more time here. Um, Juno takes a, a, a very, very uh, large orbit around our, uh, as, as it travels around Jupiter. Jupiter is a very massive planet, which means, uh, which means that it, um, it has a lot of radiation that, that, that comes off of it. Juno does get very close to Jupiter uh, at, at its closest. It gets within about 45,000 miles away. But it spends most of its life a few million miles away. And then every couple of months, Juno eventually drifts itself a little bit closer to Jupiter, allowing us to study it from nice and up close. But Juno spends most of its life a few million miles away from Jupiter. Juno is helping us to better understand how Jupiter works. Again, Jupiter is a gas giant. It's made up of nothing but gas, right? Just a whole bunch of gas. And the gas of Jupiter can form these big bands. Um, these really big bands uh, that are white, orange, and brown. Juno is helping us understand why that happened. Now, these bands that we see on uh, that that we see on Jupiter um, are also rotating around, right? And they create big storms. So, right at the middle, what we're looking at here is a big orangish red colored oval. That's called the Great Red Spot. It's the largest storm in the solar system. We can kind of see how it's forming. The orangish brown band above the great red spot is moving to the right. The white band beneath it is moving to the left. That causes the great red spot to spin around like a really big hurricane. The great red spot is about, is at least 400 years old. It's also twice as large as our whole planet Earth. And Juno is helping us understand how storms like this work. So there's a lot that Juno is helping us to understand about Jupiter. My favorite part about Jupiter, though, are not the storms, though I love them very, very much. My favorite part about Jupiter is its moons. Jupiter has a whole bunch of moons, but it's got four moons in particular that are larger than all the rest of its moons. They are named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are the four, what we call Galilean moons. We call them Galilean moons because they were discovered by the astronomer Galileo. They're each unique in their own way. For example, Ganymede is the largest moon in the entire solar system. But we're going to take a closer look at just two of Jupiter's moons today. To begin with, let's take a look at um, what's probably my favorite moon in the solar system. It's a moon named Europa. Europa is different from every other moon in the solar system almost because of what it's made of. Most moons, including the Earth's moon, are made of rock. Europa, though, is made up of lots and lots of ice. But the inside of Europa is actually really hot. It's really, really hot. That means some of the ice that is inside of Europa melts and forms a big liquid water ocean. That's what we can see here when we peel Europa in half. That small little blue layer that we're seeing drawn here is an ocean beneath the surface of Europa. So inside of Europa, there is a gigantic ocean full of liquid water, the same kind of water that we find here on the Earth. It's incredible. Now, if I had to pick one place to visit in the solar system, it would be Europa. 
it is fascinating. There's still a lot we need to learn about Europa. But what we've learned so far about it is honestly pretty incredible. Now, the other one of Jupiter's moons that I wanted to show you all this afternoon a bit more closely is the closest of Jupiter's Galilean moons uh, to Jupiter. It is a moon named Io. And the fact that Io is the closest moon to Jupiter, close to the big moons anyway, is very important. Because Io is so close to Jupiter, it's being tugged on very strongly by Jupiter's gravity. At the same time, Juno has the rest of Jupiter, or sorry, Io has the rest of Jupiter's big moons on the other side of it, pulling it in the other direction. This means that Io is being constantly tugged and pulled on and stretched from multiple directions. It makes Io look like a very big, like just very scarred place. All this tugging causes the inside of Io to heat up and get really, really hot, form kind of into lava inside of it. This lava then bubbles up out of the surface of Io as huge volcanoes. Io has more volcanoes than any other place in the solar system. It has a couple hundred volcanoes with dozens erupting all at the same time. And it's because of these volcanoes that Io gets its color, this yellow and red and orange, come from ash and chemicals that are being thrown out of these volcanoes that end up back on the surface of Io, making it look kind of like a, like a big pizza, almost, with, with all that yellow and, uh, and uh, red color on it. But Jupiter has more moons than just those four Galilean moons. We know today that Jupiter has 79 moons, at least. All of these white lines that we're seeing here are the orbits or the paths that these moons take around Jupiter. They take these very, very long orbits because they're very far away from the main body of Jupiter. And in fact, we think these moons have such erratic orbits, right? They're going in all directions, pretty much. We think that's the case because most of these moons used to be asteroids. They were then captured by Jupiter's strong gravity from the asteroid belt, and they eventually formed into moons around Jupiter. Most of these moons, though, are very small. Just be one or two miles across at the smallest. Some of them, Galilean moons, are larger. Most of Jupiter's moons are very small. Well, that's a little bit about Jupiter. Jupiter is a planet that, again, we're going to be able to see all summer long. This is, this is going to be a wonderful summer to actually look for Jupiter. But directly next to Jupiter, we can find another planet. Right? So it is right next, yes, left next to Jupiter, um, is the beautiful planet Saturn. So, so Saturn and Jupiter are, are going to be staying uh, very, very close to each other uh, in, in our sky during the summer. So they can be very easy to find uh, together. Once you've found Jupiter, it's, easy, it's easier to find, uh, to find Saturn. So uh, let me scan through our, uh, our uh, comments here and see if we've got any Jupiter questions I can answer really quickly. Um, so, uh, so, so Jacqueline asks, uh, what makes the inside of Europa so hot? It's a great question. Um, it's the same thing that makes the inside of, of Io hot. Um, the gravitational tug from Jupiter causes friction inside of Europa, um, causing that ice to, uh, causing the inside to warm up and for that ice to then melt. Um, now, uh, Anthony and I, a few, a few other uh, uh, of you have, have asked, whether there could be life inside of that ocean on Europa? It's a great question. We don't know. We don't know. It's possible on the Earth where we find water, we find life. So it's possible that we could find life inside of the ocean inside Europa. We just, we just don't quite know yet whether or not there's life there. We need to send uh, a robot there to explore it a little bit more. All right. So... 
Saturn. A lot like how we studied, uh, how we're studying right now, Jupiter with that Juno spacecraft, we also, uh, for about 13 years, studied Saturn with another spacecraft uh, named Cassini. Now, Cassini looks a little something like this. Uh, Cassini spent 13 years studying Saturn, 13 years orbiting and traveling around the planet Saturn. It's no longer active, though, today. Its mission did come to an end uh, almost three years ago, late in uh, 2017. But Cassini took a very, very interesting path during its life. And we're going to draw out the path that Cassini traveled on during its life. It went so many places. Uh, uh, you'll see what I mean in, in just a moment. Uh, we call the path that Cassini has taken the ball of yarn. So in its first four years, represented by these blue lines, that's where Cassini traveled, its green lines for the next two years, the yellow lines for the next seven years, and then the final few months of Cassini's life are represented by these red lines. We'll take a close look at those in a moment. But this is where Cassini traveled during its 13 years. It traveled all around Saturn. It studied Saturn's moons, it studied Saturn's rings, and it's almost hard to make sense of everywhere that Cassini traveled. You can see why we call it the ball of yarn when we draw out uh, uh, all these lines uh, tracing where Cassini traveled. In those last few months, in the grand finale of Cassini, which happened between April and September of 2017, it actually flew between the main body of Saturn and Saturn's rings. You see these, these few red lines traveling here. So it actually flew between the rings and the main body of Saturn. Cassini was an incredible spacecraft and is the biggest reason why we know so much about Saturn like we do today. Now, we'll talk more about the rings of Saturn in just a moment, but I first wanted to talk a bit about what Saturn is made of. Saturn, like Jupiter, is a gas giant, so it's made up of mostly gas, hydrogen, and helium. Saturn, though, is almost a billion miles from the sun. That means it gets really cold. So the gases of Saturn's upper atmosphere can sometimes freeze into big blizzards and huge storms. We've observed a few of these storms over the years that have covered all the way around the diameter, or uh, around the circumference, excuse me, of Saturn. But the largest storm that Saturn has is right up here at the North Pole of Saturn. It's this big six-sided shape. We call it a hexagon. That storm is about as big as the entire planet Earth. When we look at it using an infrared camera, on Cassini, and messing with the colors a little bit, the center of the storm looks like this. It's a beautiful storm, the largest storm that Saturn has. Again, it's larger than the entire planet Earth. It's like a big hurricane almost. So Saturn is an always active and it's an always changing place. But when we think of Saturn, at least when I think of Saturn, the first thing I think of are Saturn's rings. And they are beautiful. They're a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. But it's hard for us to know for sure, while we wait for Saturn to finish loading here, exactly how big Saturn is and how big Saturn's rings are. So to help us out, I've drawn a little model of the Earth over to the right of Saturn. So that, that little ball to the right of Saturn is a model of the Earth. So the Earth you could fit almost a thousand of them inside of the main body of Jupiter. But the rings of Saturn are also incredibly wide. I'll put up over on the left now a little scale model of our very own moon, scaled both to size and to distance. So that, 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 that little white ball to the left of Saturn is the Earth's moon. So if we could take Saturn and plop it between the Earth and the Moon, its rings would almost stretch all the way from the Earth to the Moon. The rings are almost 200,000 miles in diameter. They're incredibly wide, but they're also incredibly thin. We'll see that in just a moment. 
So the rings of Saturn are very wide, but they're only, at most, about 100 or 200 feet thick. The rings of Saturn look kind of solid as well, but they're not. The rings of Saturn are really made up of billions of smaller chunks of ice and rock. These chunks of ice and rock range in size. Most of them are pretty small, about the size of a pea. At the largest, though, they're about the size of a small car, like a mini Cooper. And these rings formed when Saturn destroyed one of its moons about 100 or 200 million years ago. A big icy moon got too close and then ripped apart by Saturn's gravity. But one thing that Cassini helped us learn about the rings is that there are actually moons that live inside of the rings. This moon that we are flying past here is named Pan. It lives inside the rings of Saturn. It's so cool. Pan is more massive than the chunks of ice and rock around it, so it clears out this big gap. We call them Cassini gaps because Cassini was the spacecraft that helped us figure out why they were there. But Pan is not the only moon that, uh, that Saturn has. I mean, it's not even close. Um, Saturn is home to the second largest moon in the solar system. This moon is named Titan. If you're familiar with a certain uh, series of movies, you might recognize Titan uh, as the home planet of the character Thanos. Uh, but Titan is a real moon. Thanos doesn't really live there, but, um, but Titan is a real place. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system, so let's compare it for a moment uh, to the size of our own Earth and our own moon. So, here's Titan, right in the middle. It's about 50% larger than our moon, and, and about a third the size of the planet Earth. So Titan's pretty big for a moon, but not quite as big as planet Earth. Now, when Cassini flew by, uh, well, uh, when Cassini flew by Titan on, on one of its very close passes by Titan, uh, it was actually able to uh, send a little probe called, called the Huygens probe that actually traveled through the atmosphere of Titan. That's part of what makes Titan so special, is that Titan has an atmosphere. It's not very much like the Earth's atmosphere. There's no oxygen. It's a very thick atmosphere, about twice as thick as the Earth's. Titan is about minus 200 degrees below zero. That fact, combined with the thick atmosphere, means that Titan has lakes on its surface. These lakes, though, don't have water in them. They have something else entirely, called methane and ethane. Methane and ethane are gases on the Earth, but it's so cold and so much pressure here on the surface of Titan that those uh, that those gases condense into a liquid, giving Titan its lakes. But just like we saw Jupiter was home to more than just those four Galilean moons, Saturn is also home to more moons than just Pan and Titan. Saturn is actually home to the most moons of any planet in the solar system. Saturn is home to a grand total of 82 moons. We can see all of the orbits of uh, Saturn's 82 moons here. Now, if, uh, uh, if you remember the reading in a science textbook um, when you were taking science class, maybe you're currently taking a science class where you're learning about the planets, you may have read before that Saturn only has 62 moons, which used to be what we thought was true. But over the past couple of years, we have found 20 more, bringing Saturn's total up to 82. Many of these moons that Saturn has are like the moons we saw around Jupiter. They're very thin chunks of, or they're very small chunks of rock, pretty much. Maybe 5, 10, 20 miles across. They used to be asteroids that were captured from other places in the solar system. So... A good question, though, is could Saturn actually have more moons than 82? Absolutely. If you had to ask me, I would bet it has more than 82. They're just very difficult to find. 
So, but we're always learning more about Saturn and learning more about Jupiter. So now that we've seen some of our summertime July uh, season constellations and planets you can look for, um, we are almost out of our uh, out of our time for our show today. I did real quick, just want to recap for everyone where you can find Jupiter and Saturn. Those are going to be the two coolest things to look for uh, during July. If you look directly toward the south, any night of the year during July, as long as it's clear, we're going to zoom ourselves in a little bit here, get a bit closer, you can find these two constellations, which are named Scorpius and Sagittarius. Directly to the left of the shoulder of Sagittarius, we find those two planets. Jupiter is the brighter of the two, and Saturn is the fainter of the two. So these are the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, that you can look for in your sky all during July. They're going to be there all the time. If you have a pair of binoculars at home, point them up at Jupiter and Saturn and see what you find. You'll even be able to see some of Jupiter's moons, those four Galilean moons you can see with, with just binoculars. If you've got a telescope at home, it's a great summer to go outside and practice using it on Jupiter and Saturn. But I do want to thank you all once again for uh, spending some time with me this afternoon exploring the July sky. A couple things, though, before uh, uh, we do wrap up and get into our uh, questions and answers. Uh, Liberty Science Center is a nonprofit, so we are right now, as we are not open currently, we are relying on your support and your donations to allow us to continue to do programs like this. So if you're able to, and if you would like to, uh, th there is a, a donate button somewhere on your screen. Again, I'm not sure where. It could be over here. It could be over here. I'm not 100% sure. There should be a button that says donate now. That's the best way to support us in continuing to be able to do all of our online programs. Um, I will be doing two shows next week. On Monday next week at 1130, I'll be doing a show for our young learner audience. Um, so that, so that, that, that's aimed at, uh, at, at, at kids uh, between pre-K and second grade. We'll be talking all about uh, constellations and the moon and the sun. It's going to be a really, really great show. That's going to be on Monday at 1130 a.m. I'll be back again next Thursday at one o'clock, recapping some of my favorite new discoveries that have happened in astronomy so far this year. We're calling that one Space News Now. So I hope to see you joining us again, either next Monday uh, for, for our, our younger ones, or next Thursday, we'll be talking uh, all about uh, some of my favorite astronomy stories that have happened in the past, uh, in the past several months. Um, so now I will be hanging out for at least another five or ten minutes to answer some of your questions. So if you've got any questions, you can uh, type them in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. I see we have uh, about 700 still joining us. So if I don't get to your question, I'm, 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 I'm really sorry. We won't be able to get to all of them, but I will do my best to answer as many as I can. Um, uh... Uh, DP wants to know what makes an, something an asteroid, a moon, or a planet? That's a really, really great question. So the simplest way to think about it is that a planet is a really big object that orbits the sun. It's got to be big enough to be a sphere. It's got to be the only big thing in its orbit. Um, and that makes something a planet. Now, if there is another like smaller sized rock, a rock that isn't big enough to be a sphere. If that rock orbits a planet, we call it a moon. If that rock orbits the sun, we call it an asteroid. So a uh, really, really big object orbiting the sun, we call that a planet. Smaller rock orbiting the sun, we call it an asteroid. Smaller rock orbiting a planet, we call that a moon. Technically, we don't have a good definite, we don't have a complete definition for what a moon is. By that definition I just gave you, all the little bits of ice and rock that make up Saturn's rings could technically be considered moons. Because we don't have a complete definition of what a moon is, believe it or not. Um, in the same way that we didn't used to have a definition of a planet. We have kind of a, a kind of an understanding definition as to what makes something a moon. 
But you could argue that all of the little chunks of ice and rock that make up Saturn's rings could also be moons. Astronomers don't necessarily recognize them as moons, but based on the, on the loose definition we have, you can make an argument, certainly. Um, so, uh, Laham, I apologize if, I apologize if I pronounce any, any names wrong. I'll do my best. Um, so, uh, uh, Alham wants to know, uh, about the probe that we sent to Titan. Did, did it measure the temperature, uh, of, of Titan? And could astronauts go there someday? Great question. So, so... It did help us measure measure the temperature and measure the temperature of Titan to be about minus 200 on the surface. So too cold for astronauts to visit on their own um, without a spacesuit or a helmet. Um, so we're not planning on sending astronauts to Titan anytime soon. It's just not, it's just a hard place to visit. Um, but we are hoping to send a spacecraft to visit Titan sometime in the next 10 years or so. It's called Dragonfly. It, it, there will be no humans there, no human astronauts with Dragonfly, but Dragonfly would be like a little drone uh, that would actually fly around in the atmosphere of Titan. It's, um, of, of, of all the spacecraft that uh, people are planning right now, Dragonfly is my favorite because the idea of a drone flying around in the atmosphere of Titan sounds really interesting to me. But that would let it fly around and visit more of Titan than the probe was able to. The probe, when it landed, it just landed and was there. It couldn't go anywhere. It didn't last for very long either. Um, but the dragonfly would be able to actually fly around and visit different places of Titan. That'd be cool. So, I see a question about how many light years away is the Milky Way's black hole? Great question. About 26,000 light years away. So, to give you a, a sense of scale, one light year is about 5 trillion miles. It's the distance that light travels in one year. So, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is 26,000 of those away. So, if you wanted to do some math to figure out the distance to it in miles, you just got to take 26,000, multiply it by 5 trillion, and you've got your answer in mind. Uh, so it's very, 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 very far away. It's nothing that it's nothing that we need. That, uh, nothing that that we need to worry about. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Sean wants to know what happened to Cassini. Great question. So Cassini eventually ran out of fuel and was damaged by the radiation of Saturn over time. Again, 13 years is a long time to be orbiting Saturn. So during its last flight, we actually flew it into Saturn. Um, flew it through the atmosphere of Saturn. So when it ran out of fuel, it crashed itself into Saturn, um, which is actually helpful. It actually uh, sent us back some data as it was doing that, which has helped us understand Saturn's atmosphere better. So uh, Cassini right now, though, um, when it went into Saturn's atmosphere, um, it eventually burnt up and we can no longer control it today. Um, but it was so important for how we understand Saturn and how we understand the uh, how we understand the solar system. All right. So what other questions we have? So uh, to answer your question, Kara, uh, 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 when the sun dies, uh, we'll turn into a black hole. So the sun will never turn into a black hole. It's not big enough to do that. To become a black hole, you need to be way bigger than the sun. You need to be a big star like Antares to turn into a black hole. You need to be huge, like 20 times or 15 times the mass of the sun. So the sun isn't big enough to turn into a black hole. Okay. Um, uh, how far away are Saturn and Jupiter from each other? That's a really, really good question. So Saturn and Jupiter vary in their distance from each other. They're sometimes closer than others. Um, on average, though, they are, I believe, about, about, uh, about half a billion miles apart. So they're, they're about 500 million miles apart on average. Sometimes, if Saturn and Jupiter end up on opposite sides of the sun, they can be further away than that. 
Sometimes when they end up closer to each other, if they end up on the same side of the sun, uh, they're, they're closer than that 500 million. Great question. Let's see. So, uh, Livy, age eight, wants to know how long is Saturn? That's a really, really good question. How long is Saturn? So if we include Saturn's rings, it, Saturn is almost, uh, is almost 200,000 miles across. So it's pretty big, 200,000 miles, if we, if we include the rings. If we just include Saturn itself, um, like the main body of Saturn, uh, that is about uh, around 80 to 90,000 miles across, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that number. I'm very bad at remembering numbers sometimes, but I think that's right. Uh, if I'm wrong about that distance, Mike will c correct me in the chat. Mike, Mike knows uh, numbers a little, a little bit better than I do. Oh, so, so Leslie asks a, a really interesting question. Why does the Earth only have one moon? That's a really good question. So the Earth only has one moon because that was all that was around when the Earth was forming. Um, there wasn't as much material that went into forming the Earth when it formed four billion years ago, five billion years ago. Um, so there just wasn't enough dust or gas or rocks around to form more moons. Um, Saturn and Jupiter have more moons than the Earth does because there was more stuff around to form into moons. Saturn and Jupiter also have the advantage of being close to the asteroid belt, so they can pull asteroids out of the asteroid belt. Jupiter more so than Saturn does. So there's isn't as much stuff around the Earth to form a moon. Um, well, Mike wants to know if there's any chance that Saturn's moons could collide. That's a really good question. Um, there's always a chance, but it's a really, 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 really small chance. Remember, these moons are really small. They're maybe even the largest ones uh, are still only a couple thousand miles across, right? Most of them, though, are like 10 or 20, 30 miles across. Because they're so small, space is really big, right? They're circling around Saturn, covering, covering literally millions of miles of, of space. Um, it, it would be like you taking, like, taking, like, a, if you get, like, a really bouncy, like, really bouncy, like, grain of sand in your, uh, in your home. You could take two like really bouncy grains of sand and bounce them around. They might collide, but because they're so small compared to the area they're traveling in, the chances are really, 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 really small. So what is this? So, so Angela wants to know what is the oldest planet? This is a good question. Um, we think all the planets are about the same age. They're about four and a half billion years old. We don't know exactly which planets fully formed first. Um, that's a really good question. Kind of depends on how you define, like, when a planet is done forming. Um, but they, they all formed around the same time. I'm about four and a half billion years old. So they're all very old. They're all very, very old. Uh, so on another question that I've seen a a few times from Vicky and from other uh, of our uh, of our viewers today is uh, what is the what is the name of the Earth's moon? Which is a, I, I get that question all the time. So the Earth's moon we just call moon. That's its name. You can call it different names in other languages, like uh, like like Luna is an, another name for the moon, but that just means moon in other languages. We call the Earth's moon moon because it was the first moon we found. We, call, we called it moon long before we knew that there were other ones out there too. So it gets the honor of being named moon. Everything else we call moons because we found them after we had already known for a long time about our own moon. That's a great question. Um, let's... So 
So I'm seeing a couple questions about what's going to happen to the sun. So the sun is going to be fine, same as it is now for about 5 billion more years. In 5 billion years, the sun is going to eventually start to run out of fuel. When that happens, the sun is going to slowly just kind of expand away. The gas that makes up the outer layers of the sun is just going to travel away into space. The inside, the core of the sun, will kind of collapse and form into a white dwarf, really dense, a hot kind of remnant of a star. All right, so I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two more. Let's see. Oh, so uh, Preeti wants to know, was our moon an asteroid before it was a moon? Ishan. So, Ishan, to answer your question, the moon didn't used to be an asteroid. It did used to be what we call a planetesimal. That's a word that means a newly forming planet. So in the early solar system, things were very chaotic, right? There were a lot of newly forming uh, planets. The Earth turned into one, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Mercury all turned into planets. The moon, though, was on its way to becoming a planet of its own. But eventually, it actually crashed into the Earth. It was smaller than the Earth, so it didn't destroy the Earth, but the moon actually crashed into the Earth. It, it almost broke the Earth apart. And together, the young Earth and the young moon broke apart into lots of little smaller pieces. Those pieces actually formed a ring around the Earth until that ring slowly over time condensed into the moon that we see today. So we, at least that's our best idea of how the moon formed. We think the moon actually collided with the Earth when, when it was just forming for almost four and a half billion years. A really, really great. Those are all really, really great questions. Okay. And the last question that we have time to answer today is whether or not moons can have moons. It's a great question. Um, they can. We've never seen them before, but they can. It is possible. Um, and astronomers are really good at naming things. And my favorite name that astronomers have ever come up with is what we would call a moon that has a moon. We would call it a moon moon. Yes. We would call a moon of a moon a moon moon. Which is very funny to think about. We've never found one, though. We, we think it's possible. We think it's possible. Um, we have found asteroids that have moons. Um, but, uh, but we have not found any moon moons yet. But I bet someday we will. I hope. All right. So uh, it's almost 2 o'clock now, which means I am all out of my time. Uh, as I've mentioned a few times, thank you again so much for joining us today um, and answering or and asking so many great questions. That's my favorite part about doing these shows is engaging with you all and answering your questions. You all have so many great questions. Um, again, uh, if, if you'd like to support Liberty Science Center and our planetarium online streams, uh, there is a donut, a, a, a donut, a donate button somewhere around here, either to my left or to my right or above me. Again, I don't know exactly where it is on your end, uh, but but uh, you can use that, that donate button to uh, uh, to uh, make a donation if you're able to and would like to to support us and our ability to keep on giving you shows like this. Um, I'll be doing another show uh, next Thursday at one o'clock uh, about current uh, about recent space news, um, and then a show for our young learners uh, on Monday at eleven thirty. Um, that's again aimed at ages or at, at students in like pre-K to two. Um, pre-K to second grade. So that's Monday at 11.30. The Space News show is going to be Thursday at 1 o'clock. Well, thank you all so much for joining me once again, and have a fantastic rest of your day.